Welcome, crew. Oh, sorry it's been so long between videos, but uh, real life has a way of being real, and uh, I have had to adjust and, uh, you know, uh, do that. So, um, for a while, it might just be commentaries and things uh, going forward. We'll talk about that uh, at the end, so please stick around. Um, I'm trying to make this as concise as possible, which is very difficult for me. I'm a very ver verbose woman. Uh, so, let's see how this goes. I've done this four times, and I managed to get it down to 16 minutes once. I might be able to do it again. So, the topic of, of this, obviously, you're looking at it on your screen, is trans representation in Star Trek Picard, and also dispelling the Lannister twins' misconception of the character Nerissa from Star Trek Picard. Now, let me go ahead here and just say, spoilers all over this thing. If you haven't seen Star Trek Picard, stop. Just stop. And go back, watch Star Trek Picard, and then come see me at least after episode eight. Um, and then listen to this. So, first and foremost, it's not a major sticking point. It's not a major plot point in the uh, in the show, but it is a facet of the character that I haven't seen picked up by anyone and talked about, and I'm not sure why that is. I'm not sure if it just hasn't been noticed or if it has been noticed, but nobody's thought about it or doesn't want to talk about it because they don't feel qualified. Um, I managed to get JP from Egotastic Fun Time to reference it in uh, his last uh, uh, video um about this uh which was cool uh jp if you're listening thank you so much for uh for taking that on and mentioning that uh and getting it out there um just as a thought you know in people's heads um so here we go um the argument is nerissa is a trans woman she um as you may know from watching the show, Nerissa is Narek's uh, sister. Narek, at the beginning of the show, when he first meets Soji Asha, the synthetic, tries to curry favor with her, tries to get her on his side and under her skin, and you know, uh, by uh, revealing some pertinent facts about himself because he's new on the ship, the Borg Cube. And um, he's trying to make an inroad, and he needs to be as sympathetic as possible. And so he mentions something personal to him. He's like, you know, oh, you know, you have a, you know, that's a very, you know, cool necklace that you have there. Oh, me and my sister have one, says Soji. Ah, he's like, siblings, you know, of that. Um, I had a brother once, you know, he died. Something to that effect. And it works, and it kind of makes the inroad there. The interesting thing about that um, is that it seems like a throwaway line, seems like a lie or just inconsequential information. But no, it's very important information, at least to this premise. Um, so, as time has gone on, people have started referring to Narek and uh, Nerissa as the eye fucking twins or the incest twins or you know Cersei and Jamie Lannister because they don't understand the dynamic of their relationship as it's been laid out in Star Trek Picard and I kind of wanted to bring a different lens to that relationship because if you look at it from how I'm about to describe it you'll notice that a lot of people are wrong. <laughs> you may even have uh, this uh, misconception, and let me explain what's going on. Narek is a Tal Shiar agent. He's only aware, I think, of the Zatbash because they pulled the Tal Shiar strings. And by episode eight, by the way, spoilers from hell, again, I'm mentioning it, okay, um, we find out that the Zatbash... Um, is a small, fairly small group of people, and anyone that's been shown the information that they have, they were all women. Um, Narek not being a woman 
probably wasn't shown that information because being shown that information drives you mad. And of all the people that were shown the uh, big reveal, as it were, uh, as to who the big bad and all that is uh, in the show, shot themselves, ripped off their own skin, bashed their heads in with rocks. Um, out of 10 people that were shown the uh, incident, um, two survived. <laughs> uh and commodore o who we find out is half rally on half vulcan uh which is why she can fuck up a mind meld like nobody's business <sighs> so that's a whole conversation all, all, all along to itself but the point is during the next during the first four or five episodes um Nerissa is trying to make her brother very uncomfortable to keep him on task, to keep him from falling for Soji because she knows him. He's her brother. She knows how emotional he can get. And he knows, you know, it's like, it's like Batman giving out a secret identity every opportunity he gets in every movie. You know, she knows his patterns. She doesn't want to see him hurt but she still needs her mission accomplished. So, all right, he's going to go and, you know, woo uh, the Android girl, which is fine. But her job, as she sees it, is to protect the galaxy. And she needs to do that in the quickest possible way, because once the genie is out of the bottle, you can't put it back in again. So she is pushing her brother to get the information from Soji and to stay on task and to, you know, get the job done. But she knows him very well from their childhood, obviously, um, and being siblings. But she also knows, and, you know, the audience knows, that she's an intelligence agent. She is the the most innermost circle of the Tel Shiar, the Zadvash. She it doesn't get higher in their society, you know, or lower, depending on your perspective. You know, she is at the central core of all the conspiracies. Um, so she is an intelligence agent, and her methods, one would have to assume, include how to manipulate people of probably either gender um, via sexual cues, um, and also, you know, various other, you know, uh, tools and tricks of the trade of subtle manipulation. She doesn't have time, however, to sit there and subtly manipulate her brother, no jokes please, um, with traditional methods. So she uses the toolkit available to her, which is the intelligence training that she's gotten. Also the personal you know information uh that she has from growing up in romulan society both initially as a boy and then as a girl um you know post-transition so she has both toolkits on board to know what gets underneath at least to some degree because we could have an, a, a discussion as to whether or not trans people you know really have a good understanding of the original gender i certainly don't um but you know at least a society has them again there's a lot of there's a lot of little fine detail granular loopholes to jump through to make sure you're studying everything precisely correctly and we don't have time for that we're already nine minutes in here the point is She's using everything in her toolkit and everything that she knows about her brother, that they're siblings, that they grew up together, that they were taken in by their aunt after their parents died. And curiously, this is mentioned in episode eight, and no mention of a brother also shows up there. So the conclusion is she's a trans woman. She's using every tool in her toolkit. Again, no jokes, please to prod Narek 
to get the job done as quickly as possible because he is uncomfortable and she will get up in his face. She will get next to his ear and whisper things in a tone that she knows drives him nuts um, because he still has this kind of mentality that, you know, again, he mentioned it to Soji, you know, just a small snippet of it. I miss my brother. You know, I miss the person that Nerissa was before she transitioned. I accept who she is now. I do. But I still have those, you know, feelings. I, I miss who she used to be. And this is a fairly common thing that, that most trans people can tell you um, that their families and friends sometimes go through. You know, I accept who you are now. I miss who you were. And we'll kind of, you know, and we'll deal with that in, in our ways and some deal better than others do. Um, so all these context clues come together to, to paint that picture. Um, I think that Nerissa is a badass character. I think that she has, um, as of episode eight, they gave her enough depth now that we can kind of get behind and see where she's going. I think she's got no tolerance for anybody who screws things up because the stakes are way too high and she doesn't even think about it anymore because there's no point. Because if she does and she takes the time to worry about, you know, implications of certain interactions, it's going to detract from her mission. And her mission is to save, you know, the galaxy. So, all of these things that she's doing to her brother to make him uncomfortable are entirely designed to keep him on task to getting the information as quickly as possible from Soji so that they can kill her, go back to the planet where she comes from, and kill all of them, and thus save the galaxy. And maybe... Maybe she can go, you know, later on, you know, watch Harley Quinn and have an egg sandwich after. But she ain't going to get that egg sandwich until or unless this is done. So that's her motivation. That's where she's coming from. And her transness is mentioned, but it is not the total sum of her character. And I think and this is where I kind of want to go into this here. I think that this is the right way to go in representing trans characters in this day and age with, um, you know, with Star Trek, uh, obviously, and definitely with other shows. Um, I don't think that, that necessarily being out um, or being explicit with it anymore is necessary or even good to, to throw in. You know, there's, you know, the CW has... Uh, dreamer in Supergirl who is out tra as trans um, in her superhero mode if you want to use that I think it's pretty clunky um, but she is out to the world as dreamer a trans woman who grew up in a town who just happens to also be half alien so there's that too the point being you can be overt about it and be respectful like they have in Supergirl, but most often, most trans people would be just only too happy to leave the, the part of their life pre-transition behind them. And for various reasons, they can't entirely leave it behind them. I know, I'm one of them. Um, but there we are. You know, that's, that's how it's represented. And... I think that it's done very well here for that reason. And I think that as, as more shows go forward, they might make a mention that a character is trans, you know, just as an aside, um, and not make it the bone to pick in the episode. Again, no jokes. You know. Uh, again, just, you know, subtle bit of information dropped here, moving on uh, because most trans people I know just want to get on with their lives and they don't want that to define them. I don't, I don't want this to define Narissa. Like here, look at token trans woman in this show um, because I don't think she's a token trans woman. And I think that she is a badass character in her own right. She's definitely got, you know, the Maleficent thing going. Um, 
But I think it's important that we at least hold up these characters and just say, oh, by the way, you know, just take note of this so that people in fandom have someone to look up to that's like them. Same way Seven of Nine stands for, um, you know, uh, at least as of episode seven, what, seven, six, episode six of Picard, um, a bisexual woman. Um, who is a survivor um, of a lot of crap, <laughs> including assimilation by the Borg when she was very young. She's a survivor. She stands for that part of the community that, you know, has survived some serious, serious crap. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's a great thing. Also, I think that Narissa also stands for, you know, for trans people. She is a trans woman. She, you know, is living her life doing the things that she needs to do to save the galaxy in this case. Um, she might be a bit misguided in that, in that role, but, you know, she's also a product of her society. And, you know, that's unfortunately uh, the way some run in society can be. But that being said, she's still a great character. And she's an amazing character, and she also just so happens to be trans. And we can lift her up there and say, look, she can do it. You know, she can be badass. You know, she can be out there. She can be accepted for who she is and not have to deal with the baggage um, in her day to day. You know, and she still gets the job done. But she also just happens to be trans. You know, you can too. You know, you can get out there, you know, change the world, save the world, you know. Um, hell, just go to the grocery store without getting harassed, you know, and also be trans. So, you know, that's that's the point behind this uh, episode, and I hope that uh, you find it uh, enlightening. And um, that's pretty much all I have on that particular point. I do have, um, I, I know I'm going to review the Picard series as a whole um, when it's done, uh, when first season's done uh, and come back to that, but I wanted to ask um, if you like this sort of thing, um, you know, this kind of perspective commentary uh, reviews, things like that, um, if you'd like to hear more from me about them, um, and, uh, if you want to see that become a regular thing here on this channel, if you do, you know, like, comment, subscribe, um, but definitely comment, uh, down below in the doobly-doo and, uh, you know, leave your questions or comments and, you know, if they're going to be transphobic, don't bother. In fact, I don't know why you're listening to this if you're, you're transphobic. Um, but, you know, if you're going to sit there and make an argument, you know, that uh, Narissa is not a trans woman and I'm just reading way too much into it, I'm going to leave you with this last little bit of information. And it's this. I have talked to people within a step or so of the uh, writer's room, and I'm not going to be real specific about that uh, because I still want that free flow of information to be happening um, back and forth. Um, but I have talked to people close to the writer's room and their reaction was basically, oh, good, you picked up on it. Um, I have it on good authority that uh, I am very correct and it was a very deliberate uh, thing worked into uh, her character to have trans representation without, you know, being subtle, without being overblown and without calling too much attention to it. Just, there it is. Because that's how we all want to be represented, you know, as far as our transness. We want to be taken for who we are, not this added, you know, subclass that, you know, screws with our life every day. Um, a lot of people who are, you know, in the writer's room have direct experience uh, with LG LGBTQ is there an eye on the end still? Uh, issues um, and wanted to subtly work it in without banging over people's heads. Um, and I think that they've done an excellent job of doing that. So, yeah. The rest is trans, folks. 
pretty cool. But moving on. If you'd like to see more commentary like this, again, leave it down in the doobly-doo. And from all of me to all of you, have a wonderful night, day, afternoon, mid-evening, after tea, whatever. And we'll see you next time on Lewis Lasagne.